Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Right. Welcome everyone. We will now uh, start with lecture th uh, 39 of module 8. This is the second part of cell biology. So um, like I said, uh, the world is divided these days into three domains, archaeobacteria, bacteria and eukarya. So if we were to focus on just the membrane lipids, people have seen biomarkers, people have observed that um, there are biomarkers that determine the differences between these three domains. So archaeobacteria have branched carbon chains attached to the glycerol using uh, through an ether linkage. So I already mentioned to you that ester versus ether is a biomarker that separates bacteria and eukaryotes on one side and the archaeobacteria, the more primitive organisms on the other side. So this is one biomarker. And look at the similarity bacteria and eukaryotes have in common the more modern bacteria and the eukaryotes have something in common and that is straight carbon chains attached to the glycerol by ester linkages so what i showed you in the previous slides is exactly that then we come to archae uh, archaeobacterial mem membranes and you can see there are significant differences so the modern bacteria or what is just called bacteria they have a bilayer and the bilayer is formed out of phospholipids only and the archaeobacterial cell membrane may be formed out of a bilayer of lipids this is one uh, possibility but they also have something very interesting they have lipid monolayers so if you have a molecule which has hydrophilic heads on both sides and a, a sort of uh, hydrocarbon chain linking these hydrophilic heads then that's what you get a lipid monolayer so you see this lipid monolayer it's got the same structure the basic structure is more or less the same but they are not two different layers it's one layer and then you also have different types of cell membranes where you have a mix so you see monolayers like this one and you see bilayers so you have a combination of the two and I think all of these are markers that tell us how life has evolved you know it may have started with monolayers and then become bilayers and it's just uh, speculation for us at this point but it's a very interesting part of microbiology um, and another point that is mentioned over here is that uh, modern bacteria as well as eukaryotes they all have only phospholipids and it's the archaeobacteria that may have phospholipids glycolipids and sulfolipids so again we see that whole evolutionary uh, tangent and then we have the presence of non-polar lipids and another difference is that you have lipid bilayers monolayers and mixtures which you don't see in modern bacteria what are the functions of the cell membrane so yeah so the cell membrane acts as a semi permeable i use the word semi permeable barrier because it's the phospholipid bilayer that won't allow anything to come in and out it has become completely clear that nothing can pass through literally and maybe only gases like oxygen and uh, other gases may be uh, the only things that can pass through this um, phospholipid bilayer so cell membranes are literally semi permeable barriers that allow nutrients to enter and toxins to leave the cytoplasm and they are all mediated all this is mediated the transport of all these things except perhaps the gases is uh, mediated by proteins um, it's, I've already mentioned to you that it's the site for energy generation using the proton motive force. So we will go into some detail about that 
in the subsequent topics uh, in in this topic but in the subsequent lectures so here we have atp synthase and this is the site at which atp is generated and to generate ATP you need a proton motive force. So just like your dry cell which has electron motive force, in the bacterial cell you have what is called a proton motive force. So the protons inside the cytoplasm are pumped out of the plasma membrane. So they go into um, the periplasmic space maybe and uh, here you get a higher concentration of hydro, uh, protons and utilizing this proton motive force that energy is utilized to create ATP. We, like I said we will cover that in the next uh, lectures. And finally the cell membrane is an anchor for several proteins that facilitate the transport and signaling pathways. So the site you have already seen that this is ATP synthase which is another transmembrane protein and you have several other proteins which will determine whether water goes in and out, which will determine whether glucose goes in and out, what is the form in which glucose will go in and out. So all these things are transported in and out of the membrane by specific proteins. So for all practical considerations you may say that the plasma membrane is either completely impermeable or you may at the least it's semi permeable it's not a very permeable uh, layer so let's come to the next thing how does any substance go through that cell membrane as i said these membranes the better word for uh, describing the nature of these membranes is selectively permeable because whether it's passive transport or active transport, they are very, very selective in allowing different substances to pass in or out. Um, the textbook that I'm referring to uh, mentions that small hydrophobic molecules may pass passively in and out of the membrane. And I'll show you some examples in a little bit. You can also have hydrophilic or charged substances which will not pass readily. Now remember that we are dealing with a uh, oily layer. This oily layer is a non, um, yes, it's a non-polar solvent. It will not allow anything like an ion to pass through. Even a proton cannot diffuse through. Okay, so that is how uh, impermeable it is. So it's not just the size of the molecule that will determine whether it goes in or out. It's also the charge that will determine whether it goes in or out. So hydrophilic or charged substances cannot pass in and out of the uh, cell through the membrane. There are two types of transport processes. We have passive transport and active transport. In passive transport, no energy is utilized by the cell. So there are three types of passive processes that we are going to look at. One is simple diffusion, the second is facilitated diffusion and the third is osmosis. So we will take a look at each one of them and the last one is active processes which require energy. So active literally means the cell has to utilize energy for pushing things through in or out and passive means no energy is utilized. So let's take a look at the passive processes first and then we will take a look at active processes. So here we have simple diffusion. Uh, let's take a look at this schematic that describes simple diffusion. So you have your phospholipid bilayer and let's assume it has some substrate, some nutrient, some food that is there in the environment which needs to be brought into the cell. So over time what will happen? This substance if it is perhaps a gas like either oxygen or CO2, we know that water cannot do this. It can only, the only possibilities these days seem to be uh, uh, gases. So it's either oxygen or CO2. These gases can perhaps in response to a concentration gradient pass into, through the plasma membrane and I will come to this uh, graphic next and eventually when the concentration is equal on both sides of the bilayer 
at that point you get this dynamic equilibrium from uh, uh, between the inside and the outside so that is the simplest one so let us see how passive diffusion would work simple diffusion how will that work we know that hydrophilic molecules charged molecules no chance for them to get in and out even by diffusion not possible for simple diffusion to happen we know that gases like oxygen and co2 are capable of diffusing in and out of the membrane without the organism spending any energy in doing this so how does it work let us take our normal aerobic heterotrophic bacteria our normal aerobic the one that we see everywhere around us it's in the water it's in the soil it's everywhere inside us outside us they are all aerobic heterotrophic bacteria what are they doing they need to take up oxygen and they need to throw out co2 co2 is the end product of this process so let us say they are utilizing organic matter we use the uh, example of glucose glucose is just the simplest organic compound that an aerobic heterotrophic bacteria can use it can be any other organic molecule so let us say glucose plus oxygen is what is required by the cell glucose cannot be transferred uh, transported into the cell without uh, some amount of energy expenditure okay oxygen on the other hand we know that oxygen level in the water is generally higher because again let me uh, answer another question and that is because the bacteria is utilizing oxygen so the oxygen inside the cytoplasm is going to be less than the oxygen in the water so that do the dissolved oxygen in the water is a source of oxygen for the cell so as long as this concentration outside is higher than the concentration inside there will be fick's law will be the operational principle so it will diffuse into the cell what is the end product the end product is carbon dioxide carbon dioxide concentration inside the cell is building up because that is the nature of the meta metabolic process so the ca carbon dioxide concentration inside the cell is higher than the carbon dioxide concentration in the water as long as that is true the carbon dioxide from the cell will diffuse out of the cell into the water and uh, so this is simple diffusion and we know that perhaps this is true for gases we know that it is not true for dissolved compounds um then let us uh, come to another part of what i was talking about let us take our simple example of glucose plus oxygen going to co2 and water now if that is the case then along with oxygen the cell requires this organic compound whether it's glucose acetate any other compound why can't that be diffusing in first is i've already mentioned that something like glucose is hydrophilic it's not hydrophobic and it will not pass through the plasma bilayer uh, through the phospholipid bilayer on its own simple diffusion will not happen so you have protein mediated uh, transport we won't call it diffusion because it's no longer diffusion diffusion is a process that happens in response to a concentration gradient so we are not going to look at diffusion we are now looking at what is called uh, protein mediated transport and when you have carrier mediated carrier meaning proteins the transmembrane proteins are the carriers and these carrier mediated transport or active transport will allow a much higher rate of solute entry so the solute which may be glucose or any other organic molecule will have a very high rate of solute entry so this is the graph that you're likely to see and this is saturation kinetics so those of you who know what saturation kinetics are you know that there is a, a limitation and the limitation is the concentration of the carriers how many carrier proteins are there in the cell and how much how much load can they take literally in terms of the organic compounds how much of the organic compound can they transfer as quickly as possible into the cell so that is carrier mediated transport or active transport and you can see how high the rate is 
compared to simple diffusion. Simple diffusion has a very slow and low rate. The carrier mediated transport or active transport, yes, you have to utilize energy for that, but you also get much higher rate of uh, solute entry. So now we come to the second uh, point and that is facilitated diffusion. Now what is facilitated diffusion? It is still diffusion driven by a concentration gradient but in this case there are transporter proteins in the membrane that help in the process of transport. So we today know that there are aquaporins, there are aquaporins which are transmembrane proteins specifically for transporting water in and out of the cytoplasm. It accelerates the diffusion of water. Remember that water is not going to diffuse through this hydrophobic layer um, of the plasma membrane. So these uh, proteins, the aquaporins are shown over here. So here you have these transmembrane proteins. You can see one of them and any uh, material whether it's water or any other kind of substance it will come in there will be what is called a conformational change the shape of the protein will change so it will open up on the side that the substrate is and then it will uh, slowly push the substrate into the uh, cell or the cytoplasm so you have the cytoplasm at the lower end and you have the extracellular fluid on the other side. So these are carrier proteins that are pushing through. It's still based on concentration gradient and they're pushing through by changing the shape of the uh, protein. We then come to the next process which is again a passive process. No energy is utilized by the cell and it's called osmosis. Now you're all familiar with osmosis. You've learned it way back in your high school and it is of enormous importance in determining especially the transport of water in and out of the cell. So here we have our cell and I can tell you from experience again that when you're harvesting cells you need to make sure that you harvest and transfer them to a media that is at the same ionic strength. So I over here, I stands for ionic strength. Ionic strength inside the cell should be equal to the ionic strength of the solution. If they are not equal, a little bit here and there is okay, but if they are not actually equal, what will happen is you will get the other two situations. You will have a situation where the ionic strength may be higher than the ionic strength of the solution or you may have a situation where the ionic uh, strength of the cell, the cytoplasmic solution or the cytosol is less than the ionic strength of the solution. So we'll take a look at all three scenarios. So like I said, if I'm harvesting cells and I'm transferring them from one media to a fresh media, I have to ensure that the ionic strength remains the same because Otherwise, you will get transfer of either nutrients or water in and out of the cell and you can cause damage to the cells if you don't take care of that. So this kind of sol uh, solution or scenario is called an isotonic solution. So it has enormous implications for doing microbiological work, enormous implications for when you are trying to culture bacterial cells. So you have your solute molecules which are in the solution and they are being either taken up or released into solution. And this is your cell wall, the water and so on, right? So there is no net movement of water in or out of the cell. Now let's take a situation where the ionic strength inside the cell is much, much greater than the ionic strength outside the cell. Okay, so based on the gradient, the concentration of water in the solution is much greater than the concentration of water in the cell. So water will push into the cell and the cell will swell and burst. And those of you who are familiar with raisins, kishmish, which we, this is the word we use in Hindi. Uh, so you know that what happens, it, these are dehydrated grapes. So 
the last one is what you get when you have dehydration you have the dehydration of the grape but then when you put it in water if you imagine that the grape is a cell when you put it in water it absorbs water because there is very little water inside the cell uh, or inside the grape so it's the same principle over here it will absorb water and it will continue to absorb water to the point that it may swell and burst so you may get what is called osmotic lysis which doesn't happen with raisins so um, that is one possibility so when we are doing cell harvesting when we are doing cell cultures we have to make sure that we have this situation and not the other two so this is called a hypotonic solution then you can have a hyper tonic solution where the ionic strength of the solution is greater than the ionic strength of the cell so in this case water inside the cell will move out and it will cause the cell to lyse and that's called plasmolysis then we come to active transport so here we have active transport i've already mentioned that saturation kinetics are much faster but there is a limit and in simple diffusion the limit is only when equilibrium is reached so just like is shown over here unless the two sides are equal in terms of concentration there will continue to be diffusion of the solute active transport happens against the concentration gradient which cannot happen for diffusion so the passive uh, transport is based on diffusion or osmosis and that can never happen against the concentration gradient the rate is much higher than simple diffusion in the case of active transport and it is necessary you will find in all subsequent examples you will find that cell functions and the integrity of most biochemical processes is basically based on active transport so carrier mediated transport shows saturation effects and then you have highly specific nature of the transport you have specific proteins these may be transmembrane proteins and a big point over here is that each uh, type of molecule or groups of molecules have uh, to have specific proteins you can't have one protein doing all the work so the cell has any number of different types of proteins which will mediate the transport of different groups of molecules or even single molecules like water um, so now we come to the next point and that is atp generation by chemo uh, osmosis so how does the cell generate atp so from our point of view we just want to know how is atp generation happening so this is a very very simplistic way of doing things so we have proton motive force now we know that proton motive force has to be generated and then that uh, force will be dissipated to get energy for the cell to store so the first thing is to generate a proton motive force and the second thing is to generate ATP utilizing that proton motive force so we have a fairly complex set of proteins which are part of the electron transport chain and if you're wondering what the electron transport chain is we are way ahead of uh, that and when we come to that you will be able to understand how complex all these life processes are but let's start with a simple introduction to how proton motive force and ATP are generated and when we come to electron transport chain we'll go into all the details so for simplicity we have uh, three complexes and one ATP synthase so we have NAD dehydrogenase complex we have cytochrome BC1 complex and we have cytochrome oxidase complex and finally we have ATP synthase so these are the protein groups that's why they are called complex because they are not a single protein there are several proteins attached to each other and um, they are the ones that are going to mediate the transfer of both electrons as well as protons so NADH is the starting point so the 
NADH that is uh, going to be tr uh, transporting both it gives up a proton and an electron and both of them are transported. So the red lines show you the transport of electrons and the blue lines represent protons and in the first uh, three complexes you get the pumping of protons out of the cytoplasm. So the bottom part is the cytoplasm and the outside or the top part is the outside of the cell and th these uh, complexes, these protein complexes are pumping the protons out of the cytoplasm. So you can see in all three cases protons are being pumped out and that will give you a higher concentration of protons at the outside rather than the inside of the cell. Where are the electrons? The electrons are together uh, with the protons here and as the protons are being pumped out the electrons are passing from one complex to the other in the electron transport chain. So you have, I am not going to go into any details, we will come to them later. They are being passed from one complex to the other and eventually for let's say aerobic heterotrophic bacteria which have an organic compound as a substrate and oxygen being converted to water. In that case, water inside the cytoplasm will pick up the electrons and that's the final terminal electron acceptor. So we have our oxygen which is the terminal electron acceptor. It will pick up all these electrons and be converted to water. And um, in the final process, we have ATP synthase. The protein, uh, the proton motive force has been created because of the concentration gradient of protons outside the cell versus inside the cell. And uh, like I said, the plasma membrane is not passively permeable, it is impermeable to protons, it has a higher concentration of protons. And the protons on the outside of the membrane will enter the cell only through this ATP synthase. So this proton motive force will now be dissipated by ATP synthase and ADP that is already there in the cytoplasm. It can be AMP, it can be ADP along with a phosphate molecule will utilize the energy that is being dissipated by the proton motive force that will be utilized to generate ATP. So it sounds very complicated and it is but that is what the life process of ATP generation is. It is a very complex process. So we have membrane transport systems and these are all part of the active transport systems. Here we have three classes of proteins. We have proteins which are membrane spanning proteins, we have periplasmic binding proteins. So we have uh, the quinone group, the cytochromes, all these are periplasmic binding proteins and some of them are a mix of the two. So some of the transport processes are where you have a mix of membrane spanning proteins and periplasmic binding proteins. And you can see this process of ATP generation is actually a mix of all these processes. So the first one is simple process, uh, simple transport which involves simple proton motive force. So here you have a compound that has to be brought into the cell and we already have the proton motive force in place. So simple transport is defined here as uh, a proton being brought in along with the substrate. So that is along with the dissipation of the proton motive force you have transport of the substrate. Then you have group uh, translocation. So in this case, the best example is glucose 6-phosphate. So when glucose has to enter the cell, it cannot just freely diffuse into the cell. It comes in, it gets what we call phosphorylated, it's converted to glucose 6-phosphate and then it comes in. So that's group translocation. And then the final one is ABC system. The ABC system is short for ATP binding cassette. Uh, it involves external proteins. So there is an external protein here. It binds to the substrate that needs to be brought in. And when it brings the substrate, when 
the entire thing does in the entire complex does not come into the uh, protein or the cell this uh, extracellular protein will bring the substrate to the transmembrane protein it will release the substrate here for the transmembrane protein to pick it up and it will bring it into the cell in the process ATP inside the cell is being utilized by binding to the substrate so this is the ATP binding cassette in terms of types of membrane proteins there are three types of membrane proteins uniporters symporters and antiporters uh, one interesting fact again part of evolution is that primary and secondary structures of all transport proteins are the same so if you remember when we looked at proteins we looked at primary secondary tertiary and quaternary structures so at the primary and secondary level all organisms have the same proteins so that is what uh, people are saying is the evidence of a common ancestor for all life forms so uh, when you see the abbreviation LUCA so last universal common ancestor which is at the root of the phylogenetic tree and all life forms uh, that I existed at any point in time including today are all considered to have evolved from that uh, common ancestor so let's take a look at uniporters uniporters are proteins that transport substances from one side to another so a simple transport mediated by the uniporter protein then you have a symporter so what i just showed you over here is a symporter so simple transport or symporter is the same thing the substrate and uh, so two substances are brought in to the cell together i'll show you examples of all of this and finally we have the antiporter antiporter means one substance comes into the cell and another substance has to be thrown out of the cell here is an example of lac permease so here we have several uh, different types of membrane spanning proteins antiporters uniporters symporters all of them are there uh, lac permease is a proton that uh, protein that exists in e coli and there are several other examples that are shown in this graphic so you have um, a symporter which is transporting protons as well as uh, sulfate into the cell another symporter here lactose the lac permease is also a symporter so they are utilizing the proton motive force and bringing the different substrates sulfate phosphate and lactose in uh, the uniporter is the protein um, the uniporter is a protein that is pumping potassium into the cell and the antiporter is sodium that is being pumped out of the cell while the uh, protons are being brought into the cell so again there is dissipation of the proton motive force along with the uh, pumping out of sodium so then we have group translocation so we have uh, phosphoenol pyruvate which is um, being converted to pyruvate and it's mediated by the first complex the enzyme uh, 1 complex and then you have the histidine protein which will um, pass the phosphate from one complex to the histidine protein to the second enzyme complex and the uh, so uh, 2a e2a and e2b e2c all of these are how the phosphate is being transported from uh, one compound all the way to glucose remember when glucose has to come in it has to be phosphorylated and glucose 6 phosphate has to be generated and this is how the phosphate is uh, attached to the glucose that is then brought into the cell so that's group translocation and then we have the last one which is the ABC system like I said it's the ATP binding cassette and what it does is you have a substrate in the periplasmic space that is going to be bound by a particular protein which is also in the periplasmic space and uh, this substrate will be released to the transmembrane protein there will be a conformational change so if you can uh, see this so you have a conformational change there is a the substrate is 
taken in. It, in a sense, the gate closes, the substrate is inside the transmembrane protein, the other gate inside the cell is opened, the substrate is uh, entering the cell and the entire protein structure, the entire transmembrane protein goes back to its original state. But what is ha important in this process is that ATP has to be utilized to change the form of the protein so that it can allow the substrate to come in and uh, to come into the cytoplasm. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you.